If art is described as something that is primarily there for its beauty and its emotive qualities, then what of a race bike that surely has been designed more for its beauty and its emotive element than that of its theoretical core focus, that of a race bike? And how much are we willing to sacrifice in the pursuit of passion and desire? how depleted a bank balance, and how bad a back. I don't need to ride this bike to know that it's going to be a stunningly good machine. See, some motorcycles and some vehicles excite purely by existing. They drum up and combine so many feelings into one vehicle of nostalgia, of history, of passion, of creativity, of single-handedly shaping the history of motorcycles. And they're so exquisitely styled in design that they stop people in the street and generate in-depth conversation. In the early 1960s, the Triumph Bonneville T120 competed at the Thruxton race circuit. Then in 1965, from that bike, the Triumph Bonneville Thruxton was born, made specifically to compete at the Thruxton race circuit. So successful was that bike that not only did it achieve good results at the Isle of Man TTs, in the 1960s, it also, in 1969, at the Thruxton Race Circuit, scored every single podium position. Here now, in 2023, we have the most powerful, aggressive Thruxton that there has ever been. Compared to the outgoing model, it's got more horsepower and it's now lighter. If you want this bike, you will have to part with 14,200 pounds. It's a 1200 cc, it's liquid cooled, it's a twin, and it's got 103 horsepower. Now that weight from Triumph is quoted at 197 kilos, but I've noticed that Triumph decided to quote the dry weight and not the wet weight, and that may well be to make it look as light as pus, but the reality is the wet weight of this bike is going to be somewhere around the 217 kilo mark. And that, oh my God, it's not light. So an out and out sports bike, I don't think this can claim to be, but if you just look at the quality, look at the lines, look at the proportion, it's pure art. Everything about this bike, visually, is perfect. Nowadays, if you want as close to perfection as you can possibly get, if you buy a Triumph, there is nowhere else to go. The quality is so, so stunning. They leave no stone unturned. There will be nothing better than this quality-wise. There are no wires out of place, no ugly bits of plastic anywhere hiding some poor wiring, some poor design elements. Look at the details everywhere on the side of the bike. Triumph since 1902. It's got a ready feel custom element to it. Look at the side panels as well. This type of detailing, traditionally you would have had to go to an aftermarket specialist to get it to this level. And if I sit on the bike, this beautiful aluminium strip just going all the way along the tank. Classic style fuel cap there. I assume this is brushed aluminium here or polished aluminium for the, the top of the yoke. It's all stunning. The clocks themselves finished with brushed aluminium and even the LCD screen here. So simple, but crisp, beautiful, understated. Any element of 
of Rider Aid's electricity, of, of Rider Aid, so of electronics, has been so well hidden here, you wouldn't even know it existed. And any of the buzzwords you want, if you're out on a Sunday ride and you stop for coffee with your friends and you want to show off about some of the keywords there, the buzzwords, well, you've got it all. You've got the show of forks at the front, the Pirelli Diablo tires, you have Olin's at the back and Brembo brakes again at the front. You've got everything you need to show off to people around you. It really is a work of art. I almost just have to step back every so often and just soak it in because it is a breathtakingly stunning bike finished to just the highest, highest standard. The purpose of a cafe racer bike is to get from point A to point B, very often involving a cafe, at least traditionally, as quickly as possible, with no regard for comfort. In fact, a cafe racer bike is the single easiest way to make a lovely comfortable bike uncomfortable. You see, you take normal pegs and you put them further back. You take normal bars, and you drop them massively. You take a normal comfortable seat, you replace it, you throw it away, and you put a plank of wood in its place. And this Thruxton is no different at all. It may be a thoroughly modern bike with all of the performance, but that doesn't mean there's any kind of comfort element to this. After about three to five minutes or so, I can very, very clearly feel that this is really no more than about one centimeter of cushioning below. What I really can only imagine is genuinely one single plank of wood. My wrists, about five minutes after I lose feeling in my backside, well, I feel like I'm entering an endurance event. Constant, constant strain on my triceps. And don't have too many serious thoughts about taking a backpack because if you have a backpack when you're riding like this, that is even extra weight. So that will be like some kind of training for the SAS. If you want to get around having a backpack, well then you're going to be looking at some kind of pannier system on the back. The problem with that is it may be difficult to find a pannier system and also you would ruin the looks of what is a perfect bike that probably won't suit the looks of panniers itself. But the engine, this has 24 horsepower more than the T120 that it's loosely based on. And taking that 79 horsepower from the T120 up to 130 horsepower for this, it turns the engine, in my eyes, into a complete masterpiece. It is strong and powerful everywhere, the most beautiful exhaust rumble, so much confidence, ability, and strength in that engine now. I don't know if I've ever ever experienced a better engine than this. It's the pinnacle of engine design for motorcycles in my eyes. The handling is good, but we can't forget that it's a heavy bike and genuinely hand on heart, you can feel that weight even when you're riding. So a svelte, slim race bike, this definitely, definitely is not. But it's perfectly pleasant handling. The suspension itself, with the shower front end and the Olins on the back. Firm, but when you're riding along and there's an unavoidable pothole coming up and you start to wince as you're coming up to it, somehow it manages to iron it out just with a very soft thud. It's almost like it knows what's coming up and it prepares for it. It's a beautifully nice bike to ride. Certainly not a sports bike, but a beautifully nice bike. <laughs>
fixed and covers ground incredibly quickly, but the brakes are so good that within the blink of an eye, you're back down to save speeds again. Gear changes, perfect. Confident clunk into gear. You never miss anything at all. It's the most confidence inspiring gear change that you can imagine. Really everything about it is pretty much perfect in my eyes. But there's one slight problem that comes in the form of a bike that's way under half the price of the Thruxton. And that is the Royal Enfield Continental GT650. Because on the Continental GT650, I'm a chain smoking, beer drinking waitress charmer. But on the Bonneville or on the Thruxton, things are slightly different. See, when I'm out here on roads like this that we've been on, small B roads, winding country lanes, that 650cc, 47 horsepower Continental GT650 is perfect. It comes alive on those roads. It's exactly where it's meant to be. It may not have the comfort, as the Thruxton doesn't have the comfort, but it's exactly the right place for it on roads like this. Not long motorway slogs, but here, flicking from left to right. And with that 47 horsepower from the Continental GT, you feel like you're using every single horsepower. You feel like you're using the entire ability of the bike. You come up to a corner, you're so hell bent on hitting that bend at the exact right angle, because you don't want to lose one meter coming out of the corner and every single centimeter that you can get into the right position on the 47 horsepower Royal Enfield, it really, really matters on that bike. But this is different because it's, this is almost too good. The B roads are of no real challenge to the Thruxton. It's too powerful, it's too, too agile, it's got too much ability, it, the brakes are too good. Everything about it is so composed, so superbly engineered that it lasts in the face of B-roads. And that slightly loses the magic element of the Cafe Racer. It doesn't quite take you back to Thruxton to those glory years. I don't get immediately transported back as a 1960s Cafe Racer. Would you like to hear one little interesting comparison? The 1960s Triumph Bonneville T120. It was a 650cc, and guess what the horsepower was? 46 horsepower. Exactly the same as the Continental GT650. So if you really do want as, as close a, a match, as true a cafe racer as back in the 60s, that Continental GT650 is as close as you can possibly imagine. You mould to the Thruxton. The Thruxton doesn't mould to you. So you need to build up a fairly good relationship with your chiropractor. You need to certainly make sure that you hit the gym hard if you want to take it on longer journeys. And you definitely need to learn how to pack light. But what do you get for all of those compromises? You get one of the most exquisitely finished masterpieces in motorcycling. And I really wouldn't be surprised if right in front of me here is the finest cafe racer there will ever be. This is Triumph's vision and realization of what the ultimate cafe racer is. Forget about money, forget about everything is, uh, forget about everything else. This is the realization of the ultimate cafe racer. It's Triumph's love letter to the cafe racer genre.